uh, behind you, as they used to say in Panto. Well, still say in Panto. Uh, it's our press preview. Uh, and joining us, uh, Emma and uh, uh, also Joe from uh, Manchester, fresh from Manchester, one of you. Yeah, indeed. Yeah, so you're, you're in the political swim. It's been a long conference season. It has. But uh, politics old style seem to be back on the front pages. The mail just in. What a pathetic apology. Now, this is what seems to be a growing row over Tom Watson, the Labour deputy leader, and um, his involvement, if that's the right word, with the investigation to Leon Britton's allegations of, of being involved in this VIP paedophile ring. Yes, the mail really going in strong there, um, I, I suppose as strong as you would expect them to. Um, so this is a, a really sort of unexpected twist in this story. We've been hearing about allegations of this Westminster paedophile ring for a long time. We knew that allegations had been made against Leon Britton and it uh, it turns out now, it emerges now, the extent to which Tom Watson apparently put pressure on the authorities to reopen an investigation into uh, Lord Britain, despite the police having already dismissed the allegation against him. And this allegation, as we now know, hung over um, Leon Britton even as he died, and his family are, are obviously really distressed about that. And, and he died not knowing that the investigation was being shelved. That's right. That's another key point, isn't That's it? That's right, yes. Yeah. So now... Uh, People are saying that Tom Watson had a political agenda in trying to push this and, and you know, whether he had a political agenda going into it or not, it's certainly going to become a political problem for him now yeah. because, of course, he wasn't Deputy Labour leader at that point when he first started pushing on this, but he is now and that means it could tarnish the whole position party. of authority. Yeah. yeah. Well, at the Times there's another element of this, witch hunt against Tories. Uh, we'll just move that up again. It's uh, quoting... Chris Fay, a former social worker and Labour councillor in South London, who passed information about Lord Britain to Tom Watson, uh, now saying that uh, he admits that there was a political motive, uh, basically indicating, as he said, he was right up for witch hunts against right-wing Tories. I, this wasn't a case of... of trying to get justice seen to be done, it was actually a political decision. Yes, it's, it's very worrying, this, this quotation. And, and also, I mean, uh, Tom Watson has said that he shouldn't have called uh, Leon Britton close to evil, and he's, he's sort of apologised for that. Um, but I think there's also a big question here about how, how the whole, whole saga has been dealt with, both by the police and by uh, politicians. I mean, it took a, a year for the Home Office to sort out uh, the public inquiry. Yeah. Two, two different chairmen were appointed. It's now, yeah. it's now Lowell, Lowell Goddard, uh, you know, New Zealand justice uh, minister. So there's a big questions here about you know, why it's been a bit shambolic. Yeah, well, and the Telegraph going with some more detail from Detective Chief Inspector Paul Settle, head of the Met Police paedophile unit, who's uh, saying here that he quit uh, the department after a series of interventions by Mr. Watson. Now that is particularly damaging if the senior detective in charge decided because of political interference he could not continue with the investigations. Yeah, there's a whole feeling around this whole issue of child abuse that for decades and decades basically the authorities dropped the ball and uh, all this abuse seemed to go unnoticed, people knew about it, no one did anything about it. And now that we all know about it, they're all swinging completely the in the other gone, direction. The, the scale of justice has gone the other way, yeah. Uh, yeah. you know, witch hunt was the phrase used and yeah. people are going to start to think that's the case. OK. Welcome to our press preview, another look at the morning papers. But first, our top stories for you tonight with Pauline Caffaki, the British nurse who contracted Ebola in Sierra Leone in a serious condition after being readmitted to hospital in London. The former boss of Marks and Spencer, Lord Stuart Rose, will be heading up the campaign to keep Britain in the EU. That in campaign will launch officially on Monday. And Labour's deputy leader, Tom Watson, has insisted he acted appropriately by asking prosecutors to investigate rape allegations against the former Home Secretary, Leon Britton. So it is now time for that press preview and joining us for all the headlines, The Economist Britain correspondent, Emma Hogan, and The Evening Standard's political correspondent, Joe Watts. But first, as ever, all the front pages, the Telegraph, saying that the detective in charge of the VIP sex abuse investigation stepped down because he felt he was being undermined by the Labour MP, Tom Watson. Times reports that the man who approached Mr Watson, accusing Lord Britain of being a paedophile, has now admitted that he was up for a witch hunt against right-wing Tories. While the Daily Mail calls Mr Watson's apology for the rape allegations pathetic, quoting Lord Britain's brother, saying it was inadequate because it was qualified and hedged. 
The Independent going with the official figures showing that NHS hospitals are in their worst financial position for a generation. While its sister paper, The Eye, says a billion pounds of extra debt has prompted fears that these hospitals will struggle to cope in the coming winter. Financial Times goes with David Cameron's meeting with the German Chancellor, Angela Merkel, at Chequers, saying that he's urged her to ke help keep Britain in the European Union. Guardian says a Western-style diet is fueling new fears about obesity, with data suggesting that by 2025, almost a billion adults worldwide will be obese. Daily Mirror has a story about a pregnant woman who was given Viagra by doctors in an attempt to save her unborn baby's life. Daily Express says the National Lottery has been accused of operating the biggest con ever after they decided to add 10 extra balls to the pot. And the Daily Star reports that Strictly Come Dancing contestant Peter Andre has been told he's got to do a bit more footwork. Let's see what Emma and Joe have made of that. Well, you've gone for an inside page for your first one, page two of the Express, and it is the latest uh, on Russia's actions in the Middle East and Syria particularly. Interesting, actually, it's not making any of the front pages, is it? Yes, I, mean, I, was, I was particularly struck by mm. that. I mean, I, I, think yeah. it, I, think it's, I think it's quite... I mean, I was quite surprised, really. It, I mean, Russia's actions are incredibly reckless. It's sort of they're, they're, they're basically doing a proxy war against the West. They're distracting from... You know, there's a withdrawal in Ukraine. Um, and they're, they're, they, as this headline says, they're inflaming civil war. They're making a, what's already a dreadful situation worse. So yeah. I'm surprised it's not on the front well, page. Well, particularly we had Michael Fallon, um, yeah. Defence Secretary, saying that you know, Russia's campaign would not divert NATO's efforts against ISIS. But what are NATO's Indeed. efforts? You know, what, what message is coming from Washington and the Obama um, Yes, there's complete approach. confusion uh, at the moment, actually, amongst... Western leaders, and there is this feeling that they've been completely outflanked by Vladimir Putin. In this situation in Syria, you know, it's, it's a horrific civil war nationally. There were very te um, complicated regional factors, and now it looks like it's threatening uh, to become this real global conflict with the possibility of Western jets and Russian jets operating in the skies over Syria at the same time. So it could become incredibly dangerous. And I think in that sense, we're now hearing that uh, the government want to delay a vote on Syria in the House of Commons. You know, they want to wait and see what the international community is going to do mm. about Russia's actions. So there's a real feeling that we're sort of behind the curve on this at the moment. Is, is it a, uh, a opposing view, if you like, that uh, actually just let Putin get on with it and he could get mired in this as the Russians did in Afghanistan? that the argument always against any power going into Syria was it was so complex mm. that you couldn't actually solve it by just one military operation, you know, the boots on the ground. Well, what's worrying here is that they claim, Syria, Russia claims that it's targeting IS forces, but yeah. actually it's also targeting those against Assad. And you know, Assad is, is one of the main reasons why his people are being killed. And, yeah. and so there's a question here of really of, you know, whether they're propping up a, a or even strengthening Islamic State yes, as a result of that. Exactly. I mean, and interestingly, in Russia, this, it's, it's, this it's, it, uh, support for, for this intervention in Syria has increased, and they're, they're sort of they're spinning it in a strange kind of way that they're actually showing that they're with America, that they are is just mm. just as strong. The as international a, reaction. Yeah. I think that shows that the Russians have, in a way, learned the lessons of Afghanistan. Um, I, I'd be very surprised if they now sent in tons and tons of troops and tanks mm. and all the heavy hardware that they that we saw with the invasion of Afghanistan. You know, what we saw with Ukraine was uh, a sort of very clandestine conflict happening. And even though we've got Russian jets happening, uh, flying over yeah. Syria now, I think we're going to see a lot of um, sort of special forces and volunteer uh, troops going in to fight, possibly with the Saudi forces too. But I mean, what, what, what would happen if a Russian aeroplane was shot down by NATO over Turkey? I mean, this is a, mm. there's a huge implication. And, and there have been two incidents, of course, close to that border with Turkey already. Yeah. Or even if there's a mid air collision between two planes, you know, without actually direct uh, co a military confrontation. Yeah. Uh, OK, let's go back inside. We're back to the Express now, page four. Uh, and that is, yes, uh, it's that man again. Uh, Corbyn, well, actually, Corbyn savaged by Labour MP and also savaged by the Italian newspaper La Repubblica on the right-hand side. Yes. We'll, we'll, we'll go to the, um, the local difficulties first before we're in his own party. Yes, so this is Trist Tristram Hunt, the former education, uh, Shadow Education Secretary. Yeah. He's basically accused Jeremy Corbyn of sort of relying too much on a sort of online base of sort of saying that, you know, 
placing too much emphasis on, on what people online think, which is, is a sort of interesting echo of what David Cameron said at the party conference this, this, this week. Where he I said, remember the, the first Prime Minister's questions, of course, when he, he basically put the questions from precisely. the net with people asking the Prime Minister questions. Precisely. And so David Cameron said, you know, Britain and Twitter are not the same thing. So there's mm. sort of, I mean, obviously a lot of the part of the, the, the momentum behind the sort of Corbyn campaign has been from social media, has been from younger voters who have become engaged through that format. So obviously there's a reason why he yeah. places, places an emphasis on it. But Tristan Hunter sort of suggested that they're getting distracted too much by their not, not appealing to the core voters who, who voted Conservative in May. Yeah, it would be interesting to see if this uh, speech from Tristram Hunt is the sort of start of a counter-offensive by the modernisers in the party, of which Hunt is one of the leading players. Um, you know, Parliament's going to be starting again now. Yeah. Liz Kendall is back. She's going to be in the mix in Parliament. And you've got Chucker and Muna, uh, who is there and seen by many as a potential uh, prince waiting to come in and take over in case Corbyn falls. Uh, so it's, a, it's a, I suppose, a big problem for Corbyn. He did, in his own speech, um, launch a big broadside against the newspapers and say, you know, Twitter and Facebook and social media, that's, that's the way people are going to communicate and get their information from now on. So I suppose you would expect the newspapers to jump on this story and have a go. But it'll also be interesting to see how often Tristram Hunt gets dismissed as a Tory uh, by those Corbyn supporters on Twitter and Facebook over the next few days. Yeah, and, and the other aspect, going back to that Prime Minister's questions, I mean, is it the fact now with Parliament resuming after the party conferences that he's got to land punches on Cameron, politically speaking, at the dispatch box. He can't get away with this approach of, you know, Mrs. Uh, Figgis has now got this question on bins from Barnsley, whatever. You know, OK, it's, it's, it's fine as, as a, an approach to start with, but he's really got to start looking at the, the mm. issues of the day and, and trying to work out how he can forensically attack Cameron. I would suspect him to sort of go for a hybrid tactic next. So he will come up with these questions from the public, but yeah. then he will use his own questions to sort of develop the attack. So but mix and match a bit. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the crucial thing about that tactic originally was that he can use those questions from the public as cover to shield himself from David Cameron's quite eviscerating attacks sometimes. And he can say, well, you can't attack the public. You know, these are the voters. You can't criticise them. And he's going to continue to try and hide behind that to ask his own yeah. questions. Yeah. But he can't hide behind his shorts, it seems. If we move across the other <laughs> part of the page there, uh, no, it doesn't even... Oh, there it goes. Didn't want to look at his shorts in too much detail, it seems. Um, the Italians are not very impressed, it seems. Yeah, no. wonderful story, this. Uh, La Repubblica, the Italian newspaper, has printed 13 photographs of Jeremy Corbyn's And oh, we've worst, only got two there. How disappointing. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, long black socks, one with shorts and trainers. He still has much to learn. Pastel coloured shirts, hardly ever coordinated with his jacket, and trousers too slim for his big frame. <laughs> Striped polo shirts, blue shorts and socks halfway up his leg. Um, yeah, I have to say, I haven't seen Berlusconi in the past sort of feature. I, and that's the flip side. I mean, do you want Berlusconi? Do you want someone who's very well dressed? And, or, or, or do you want Jeremy Corbyn? Interesting question. Berlusconi or Corbyn? Who would you throw out of the lifeboat in the... Uh, oh, no, my no. goodness. Uh, <laughs> but, I mean... D I think it's actually going to play to his strengths well, in a this certain is way. Gonna, yeah, yeah. Because people anti, do say they like the whole fact that he's authentic. Yeah. You know, if he suddenly came out in a smartly cut Italian suit, they say, well, you know, You've he's, he's changed, yeah. he's sold out. So he has to wear uh, the striped polo shirts and the ridiculous shorts. He has to wear his socks like that, or, you know, he'd yeah. be uh, not being himself. But, what, I mean, what, what is the feeling in Westminster? Is he, is he permanently in a bad mood with the press, the media? Because he, he doesn't seem to be too happy when the cameras appear, does he? Yeah, I, I, um, I don't think he considers the press any friends. Uh, but, I mean, that, that's not a new thing. If you go back to Ed Miliband, yep. you know, he was pretty... Uh, certain from the start that he wasn't going to have too many friends in the press. But, uh, you know, Linton Crosby said that um, Ed Miliband was Jeremy Corbyn light and now Labour's gone full fat. So I think that shows that, you know, Corbyn's going to take an even tougher line on the press and that goes with his whole view of Twitter and Facebook and so on. Yeah, I even the Italian press. OK, coming up in this next uh, section, a number of obese adults, a billion it could soon hit. How come? We'll be telling you in a moment. Welcome back. It's more from the press preview and it's uh, more from both uh, Emma and uh, the 
uh, economist and also Joe and the Evening Standard. Uh, as we head for politics old style, Daily Mail, what a pathetic apology. And this is um, Tom Watson and, what well, it is an apology over the allegations concerning Lord Britain. Uh, but Sir Samuel Britton, uh, the former Home Secretary's brother, saying it was inadequate. Yes, so uh, Tom Watson has really been championing the claims of uh, some of these alleged abuse victims. And he's done it to such an extent that there are people claiming he had a political agenda. And now some of those claims, some of the witness claims, are starting to unravel. Yeah. Uh, it turns out that the police have dismissed the allegation against Lord Britton. And he did come out... Tom Watson came out and made a statement today admitting that some of the language that he used perhaps he shouldn't have used uh, uh, and he kind of gives a half apology he says that he's already apologized for the distress felt by the family but it seems that's not enough for some people and the knives are really out for him now so this could obviously become quite a big problem for the Labour Party now that he's become deputy leader. Yeah, because it's on the front of the Times as well, which goes with this line of witch hunt against Tories. It's quoting Chris Fay, this former social worker and Labour councillor who passed the information to Tom Watson. Mm. I mean, obviously, as, as Joe says, this has become... I mean, Tom, Tom Watson's involvement has become sort of incredibly more sort of looked at because he's become now the sort of... Deputy leader. De yeah. Deputy leader. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, there's also big questions here, I think, about how this this whole case has been, the cases have been dealt with by both police and politicians. The Home Office took a year to get the sort of its review yeah. sorted up. It had, to, it, had to, it had to get rid of two different people chairing it because of conflict of interest. So there's sort of, I mean, there's, there's long historical questions of, of, sort of whether the police have, have sort of ignored Well, I mean, the, the Telegraph, yeah, it goes even further. I mean, they're quoting this uh, Detective Chief Inspector Paul Settle, who was the head of the paedophile unit, who basically, they say, quit the scandal or at least the inquiry after a series of interventions by Mr Watson. Yes and it was, it was a, a he quit last year so it's sort of it's now come up on the front page because of uh, Tom Watson's role in the Labour Party so it Yes and I suppose there is the, the sort of horrific potential situation that could arise now that because uh, it, it's felt that some of these allegations may have been overregged that some real problems yes. or real uh, allegations may be overlooked because people don't want to take them too far or, or be seen to... Yeah. Uh, and of course, the, the difficulty was that the um, status quo, if you like, was that people felt the thing had been ignored or brushed under the carpet, mm. therefore there was the need to be perhaps a bit more proactive about mm. pursuing these these. It uh, kind of boggles inquiries. the mind, you know, the authorities, the, the CPS, the police, they yep. have procedures to make sure that these things are carried out in a fair and balanced way. So it really does boggle the mind that such pressure, such political pressure, such pressure from public opinion yes. can sway and push those procedures so far off course.